Saul. And so this comes from uh, Acts 9, verses 1 through 6. And the Bible's out here on the tables if you'd like to read along, or you can read along up here. So meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? And the reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. And then John 21, 15 through 19. And this comes from the Gospel lesson near the end of the Gospel. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend to my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said in him, to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And after this, Jesus said to him, Follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Now, I grew up as a um, United Methodist. I grew up uh, in the United Methodist Church down at Virginia Beach. And if you go to Virginia Beach on 19th Street, there is this very large church that, that many tourists from up north mistake for a library for some reason. <laughs> but it is a church. It has a spire. It has Peter in the boat reaching out to Jesus and Jesus holding his hands out. It's, it's, it's a pretty neat church to go to. We have like 800 people there on a Sunday. Well, I went to that church, but my church experience never included an altar call. Anybody else Methodist like that? How often do we do altar calls in church, <laughs> right? So this first story I'm going to share is about a, a time when I was a youth director uh, in New Mexico. The darkened gymnasium was filled with 400 crying teenagers. I want you to imagine this. 400 crying teenagers at once. And the spotlights, they focused on the altar rail and the 20-foot tall cross that had been placed in front of it. And there was a preacher and there were several other ministers and they waited at the front next to that altar rail. And they waited for the youth as they filed up to pray the sinner's prayer and to be saved. And almost everyone came up. The band kept on playing. You know, they play too long. Anybody been to a church like that where they play too long? They're like, everybody needs to come up front. And if you don't come up front, they're going to guilt you in the back, right? Anybody feel that way? Well, I stood at the back of that gymnasium, and, and my hands were folded across my chest like this. And this is probably how I looked. Because, honestly, I had never experienced an altar call in the United Methodist Church. And here I was at a United Methodist summer camp, in, in New Mexico. And I had heard about altar calls. I mean, Billy Graham's the big one, right? But I had never actually been a part of one. And even when I was there, I still wasn't a part of that because I was just standing in the back like this. And I remember thinking, why am I not inspired by this? Wasn't it great that all these kids were coming up from all over New Mexico and, and they were committing their lives to follow Christ? Wasn't it great that a preacher could preach such a good sermon that all those kids could start crying on a dime? I mean, how manipulative was it? Anyway, how great that was. I mean, I remember that's what I was thinking. And, and the thing is, I still wasn't a part of it. And I was a youth director. I, I should have been touched, and I should approve of what was happening at that summer camp. But instead, I was standing at the back of that gymnasium feeling disconnected from everything that was happening that night. Now, I couldn't recognize Jesus in those moments and in those words. 
and in those emotions of that crowd. I, I couldn't see Jesus and the preacher who spoke about sin and shame and deliverance. I just couldn't see Jesus. The Gospel of John records that Jesus stood on the shoreline watching the disciples gather their nets. He even spoke to them and asked them if they had caught any fish, but they did not recognize him at first. And when they said no, he said, well, why don't you just put your nets over the other side? And they did. And when the fish overflowed the net, a few of them knew it was the Lord. They said, hey, wait a minute. We think there's maybe God here with us. John then writes that Jesus invites them to have a meal on the beach. And they have bread and fish. And so we know that Jesus is physically human because he's actually eating and consuming the bread and the fish. And it was in the miracle of the abundance and in the miracle of the breaking of the bread that Jesus was revealed to these disciples after the resurrection. And we hear in the gospel that this is the third time that the Lord appears to them. We hear from the, gospel, uh, from the book of Acts that, that a few years later, maybe a few months later or a couple of years later, after the ascension, after the first church has been established, Luke records that there's a guy named Saul, a Pharisee, who is going on, a, on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus. And, and on his possession, in, in his arms or in his backpack, whatever he has, he has some court orders from the high priest saying, we're going to arrest every Christian there is in Damascus. But it was on that trip in Acts 9 that an overwhelming light overpowered Saul, and a voice cried out to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And in that encounter of Jesus, uh, we understand that Saul has no idea what's going on, and his companions hear the voice, but they do not see what Saul is seeing, which is an image of Christ there. And Luke records in Acts that these companions stood speechless. And Saul responded to these words he heard by saying, Who are you, Lord? And of course, Jesus speaks, and thus is recognized by the biggest enemy of Christianity at the time. We know Saul by another name, because he became Paul after that. For after this road, his experience on the road to Damascus, Saul went from being one of the biggest critics and persecutors to Christianity to its biggest supporter and its greatest theologian. In that conversion experience, Jesus was recognized. And in Saul's blindness, the light of Christ was seen. I spoke with those 11 youth of mine who I had brought to that summer camp. And we were on our, our way back to home, which was six hours away. Now, the thing about New Mexico, it's kind of a big state. It gets overshadowed by Texas because Texas, you could drive 12 hours and still be in Texas. But even in New Mexico, we were in the southern part going up to the northern part, six hours in a 15-passenger van that I was driving. Can you imagine that? And it's 100 and something degrees outside, and the van can't keep up with the air conditioning. It was miserable. But I remember talking to these students in the, in the van on the way home. You know, half of them were part of my youth group. They were there every Sunday youth group. The other half were, were students that we had picked up from our local community. And, and many of those kids came from a very impoverished background. Uh, but all of them were excited. All of them enjoyed going to that summer camp. And all of them were pumped up by the altar call experience. And, and, and there was a change that had overcome them. Even though I hadn't been there, even though I'd been sitting on the back of the gymnasium like this, they had experienced God, and they wanted to share that with me. And they asked me questions about what it meant to be a Christian. And, and it made me excited for a little while. They had their mountaintop experience, but I was still looking for the sign that led me to the trail to the top. But seeing their excitement and hearing their eager questions, it gave me a glimmer of hope. <clears throat> but as we got closer to home, as the miles and the hours clicked on by, a new change came over that group. The excitement wore away as many of those teenagers in that van remembered the realities that they were returning to. Some of those teenagers were part of gangs, and they knew that if they revealed that they had had some Christian experience, they would be laughed at and ridiculed by their friends. <clears throat> Others who were regulars in my youth group were a lot more involved in sports, and they were looking forward to the next camp. And so even they started getting their minds back into going back home to play their video games and get ready for the sports camps for the rest of the summer. And I had a sneaking suspicion that some remembered how boring our preacher was. <laughs> I was a youth director. I remember I could say that. So. 
And when we arrived home, and I opened the doors to the van, the transformation was complete. They were back on home turf. And this persona that they had taken on, this change that had overcome them, well, they had reverted back to being those normal, dis normal teenagers they were before we had left. And if Jesus were there, I remember thinking, then he was kind of hiding <laughs> very well. While the disciples and Jesus were eating on that beach long ago, Jesus asked Peter some questions. Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says to him, feed my lambs. And then Jesus asks a second question. Peter, do you love me? And Peter again, again, Peter says, yes. And then for a third time, and Jesus says to him, follow me. And these three questions, the three repetitions of that question, do you love me? The three denials of Peter on the night that Jesus was betrayed were erased. <clears throat> Peter was reestablished as the leader of the early church. And we know that Saul listened to Jesus. He had been struck blind on that road, and Jesus had told him to visit a certain follower in Damascus named Ananias. And of course, this follower was a little skeptical, but when Ananias healed Saul, and Saul proved his obedience to God, Ananias was comforted. And he was baptized, Paul was baptized, and began to proclaim that Jesus was the Son of God. Now, I had a chance to return to that uh, town that I had been a youth minister at. I brought my wife, my soon-to-be wife, there. Actually, that was the weekend that I brought her out to be engaged. I, I took her all the way out to New Mexico, asked her to marry me out there. And, and I had encountered one of those former youth who was now in college. And uh, we had lunch together. And he told me that he was going into the ministry. And I said, really? <laughs> I said, when did you have that call to the ministry? And he said, well, remember that summer camp experience? <laughs> remember that night we had the altar call? I heard my call to ministry then. And he described it to me as one of the most powerful experiences in his life. He had experienced Jesus. He had encountered Jesus. He had recognized the presence of God even when I had not. He had responded with faith when I had responded with cynicism. Even in what I thought was very manipulative and an inappropriate way to speak this message of Jesus Christ, and I still think that. I don't like altar calls that much when it's done to 13-year-olds. Even though I had those, have that judgment, this young man still had seen Jesus and had responded with dedication. And through this witness to me as a college student, and me being in my mid-20s at that point, I encountered Jesus. I no longer saw that experience as, as one of just failure or guilt-tripping Christianity or emotional manipulation of young people. You know, I knew that it occurred, but I knew of one person who had had their life totally changed in an encounter with God. The truth is, we will encounter God in different ways. It may not be as powerful as the one that Paul had. I doubt any of you are going around with arrest warrants to arrest people who are Christians and need to be converted in that way. But maybe our encounter is more like the one that Peter had. Here you have Jesus talking with Peter on a beach, and, and Jesus just says to Peter over and over, do you love me? And maybe we've been like Peter at times, and we've denied God in our life, and we need to repent of that. And maybe, maybe our encounter with Jesus is a lot more low-key. Maybe it's in worship service one day. Or, or maybe it's in studying of Scripture and learning something new. Maybe it's in that aha moment as we read Scripture again and again and again and finally come up with a, a new understanding. Maybe it's when we sing hymns. Maybe it's when we sing songs. The thing about encounters with Jesus is that they require something of us. For Peter, it was the establishment of a church. For Paul, it was a total transformation from being an oppressor. And for my former youth, it was an openness to hearing a call to ministry. And for me, it was seeing that God can work in any situation, even the ones that I may disagree with. And for you, it will be something different. 
But I promise you that when you encounter the risen Christ, your life will be changed. Whether it be on a mountaintop or in your chairs at one of our services. Or maybe it's the singing of the song as Rich and I banter back and forth. Maybe you will encounter God and it will challenge you and it will comfort you. Amen. Amen.